In this episode, I sit down with Mark Lichtenfeld, who is the senior editor of the Oxford Income Letter and author of the best-selling book, Get Rich with Dividends. In this episode, we discuss how Mark got started with dividend investing, why investors fail, and what Mark looks for in dividend stocks. Hi, my name is Kanwal Sarai, and welcome to the Simply Investing Dividend Podcast. Mark got his start at the trading desk at Carlin Equities, then worked as a senior analyst at the Avalon Research Group. Mark's work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, U.S. News, and he's been a guest on CNBC, Fox Business, and Yahoo Finance. I'm honored to have Mark as a guest, and in this wide-ranging interview, we talk about the importance of dividends and dividend investing. Mark, welcome to the Simply Investing Dividend Podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day, Mark, uh, to be here and share your knowledge and insight and stories with our audience. Why don't we start at the beginning? If, if you mm -hmm. can tell our audience a little bit about yourself and how you got started with dividend investing. Sure. So I'm the chief income strategist at the Oxford Club. And um, I, I think like a, a lot of things in life, uh, you know, I had kind of a, a fortunate accident, I guess you could say, when I was 22 years old. I was working in a job I really did not like. That was not the right job for me. My first job out of school, I was working for a small ad agency in New York City. And, and one of my jobs was to open the mail for the owner of uh, the agency. And he used to subscribe to uh, Russell's Dow Theory letter. And so uh, at that point I had no money. I was making $18,000 a year living in New York City. So I wasn't really flush with cash. But one of the things that I read in this newsletter was uh, about the idea of compounding. And you know, even though I was you know, fairly well educated, I did well in high school and college, Nobody really ever sat down and taught me about compounding. Uh, I, I, I certainly knew enough to not get into trouble with credit card debt, but, but nobody really explained to me the idea of compounding your wealth. And this article just really explained how back then, this is a long time ago, the maximum contribution you could make to an IRA was $2,000 a year. And it explained that if at the age of 21, you started investing $2,000 a year and then stopped at the age of 31. By the time you got to 65, you would have more money than if you started at 31 and invested every year until you were 65. So just investing $2,000 a year for 10 years, starting 10 years earlier, grew into more money than $2,000 a year for 34 years. And just the light bulb went off. It, I just got it. Um, so even though, like I said, I was making $18,000 a year, I had no money, I was paying rent in Manhattan, I figured out a way to start contributing $2,000 a year to an IRA. And every year since then, I have been contributing either to my IRA, to my 401k, as much as I possibly can, because that had such a profound impact on me. Um, but, you know, I was 22 years old. I, I really didn't know anything about the stock market at that point. So I just put it into some mutual funds and, um, you know, kind of hope for the best. And as I, as I, uh, kind of progressed with, with my, um, well, I wouldn't even say it was my career cause I, I wasn't working in the markets. I, I was, I was kind of floundering along career-wise, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, but I was spending all of my free time studying the stock market. So eventually in my late 20s, uh, I got into the markets as a career and yeah, and, and, and kind of always had this idea about what's the, the best way I can compound my wealth. And again, I was investing in mutual funds. I was starting to invest in stocks. And that's when I discovered dividend stocks and, and dividend growth stocks. And, and so when I realized that the dividend growth stocks would be what would really accelerate the compounding for me. And that's when I just did you know a ton of research. Uh, I was already writing about dividend stocks for the Oxford Club. And kind of once I, I had this eureka moment about the dividend growth stocks and, and 
they're companies that I call perpetual dividend raisers. So these are companies that are raising their dividend every year. That's when I, I went ahead and wrote the first edition of my book, Get Rich with Dividends. That's an incredible story. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of people start off that way. I know I started off that way in the beginning was just putting money in mutual funds. And I mm -hmm. just didn't know any better. <laughs> I was just following what my, par my parents did. And they said, well, you're working now. You should save for your retirement. And that's what I did. Yeah, and, and back and. And back then, that was, you know, kind of the, the, this was, you know, before the internet, you know, for me at least. And there just wasn't a ton of information. You could read Money Magazine and, and the Wall Street Journal, and, and everybody was, you know, was, was kind of pounding the table hard on mutual funds. It was kind of the golden era of mutual funds. So that's kind of what everybody did. And, you know, I, I can't complain too much. They, they served me well at that, at that time. But uh, for me, at least, investing in dividend growth stocks is, is definitely the way to go. Um, and, and I do still own some mutual funds. I mean, I'm not 100% in dividend growth companies, but it, for me, it, it, it's certainly the, the better way to go. Yeah. And I like what you said, and it's this is in the book, Perpetual Dividend Raisers. I love that. That's good. You should copyright that term somewhere. Uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. And so tell our audience, what do you mean by that? Because in the book, you talk about dividend aristocrats, and then I want to ask yeah. you about junior aristocrats. But Tell our audience what that definition, what that means. Sure. So uh, a perpetual dividend raiser is, is a company that raises its dividend every year. Uh, and there's not really a, a finite number that makes it qualify. It's kind of a broad term. So whereas you have dividend aristocrats, which are members of the S&P 500 that have raised their dividend every year for 25 years or more, uh, a perpetual dividend raiser could be a small cap company that has raised its dividend every year for five years. Uh, but it, it's 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 a company that has that track record of raising it every single year, and you want that consistency uh, because there are plenty of companies that might raise, uh, you know, one year and then three years later and uh, twice the next year, but then not again for four years, just kind of depending on on their cash flow. But I want that consistency of every single year knowing that I have uh, a raise coming, and 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 if I don't, then that's a big red flag. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. So, what do you look for, uh, Mark? Are you looking for a sort of a five-year track record, ten, twenty, maybe three? Do you have a um, a range? <laughs> generally speaking, I I want five years or more. Um, and and I also, you know, I, I want kind of a a mix in my portfolio, just like. I would diversify across various sectors and various market caps and geographies. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily need all dividend aristocrats where they're all, you know, 25, 30, 40 year track records, uh, because sometimes those companies that are kind of just starting on that journey with that five year track record, they can sometimes raise their dividends by significant amounts. Uh, and, and that growth might be a little bit more than with a company that's been doing it for 40 years. So I'll try to have a, a nice mix of companies that have been doing it for decades and decades and companies that are are early on in their dividend raising track record. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. Uh, dividend increases. And I just have like three examples here. I was looking at it this morning to make sure I got the numbers right. Uh, so as of today, Johnson & Johnson has had 61 years of consecutive dividend increases. Coca-Cola, 62 years. And Procter & Gamble, 66 years. They've been paying a dividend consecutively since 1890. That's wow. an incredible track record. And going back to what you said about compounding, not only are, I'm assuming, you're reinvesting the dividends. A lot of dividend investors, that's what we do. But you're also getting more dividends every year as the companies grow the dividend. So now you've got more money exactly. to reinvest. Yeah, that's incredible. So Mark, what are your, um, and I know you talk about this in the book, but if you can give us a high level overview, what are the kinds of things that you look for in a stock, in a dividend stock before you decide to invest in it? Sure. So the, the most important thing is cash flow. And, you know, I, lo I know Wall Street and, and especially the financial media mostly focuses on earnings. And that's kind of the, the headline number, you know, every quarter. Um, but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper to look at cash flow because earnings have all kinds of non-cash items uh, in that calculation, meaning things like depreciation, stock-based compensation. Uh, so I, I'm more interested in how much cash a company actually brought in because the dividend is paid with cash. It's not paid with, uh, you know, non-cash expenses and, and, and depreciation and things like that. So I want to know 
how much cash the company brought in this year or this quarter, and is that enough to pay the dividend? Uh, so that's that's really the most important thing that I look for. And then once I see how much cash flow the company has brought in, I want to know that the payout ratio is low enough that should they stumble, let's say in a year or two, because you know I'm looking at this for the long term. I'm not looking at this quarter to quarter. I'm hoping to own the stock for five, 10 years, maybe more, so that if next year is bad, we have some some black swan event again, like like the pandemic, or you know, there's a recession, that if cash flow goes down, there's still enough to pay the dividend. So I want there to be a little bit of a cushion. So generally speaking, I'm looking for a payout ratio of 75% or lower, meaning that they pay out 75% uh, of their cash flow in dividends or less. And, and just one thing to, to mention, usually when you hear the term payout ratio, they're talking about based on earnings. So the percentage of the earnings that are paid out in dividends, I'm looking at it from cash flow and, and usually free cash flow. It, it depends on the company, but usually I'm looking at free cash flow. Uh, that's very interesting. So you're looking at the, like you just said, the payout ratio, the, the, the standard definition is looking at the dividend versus the earnings. So I'm just going to repeat what you said. So we end, we get this. So you're looking at the dividend over the free cash flow. Correct. Okay, that is that's incredible. And so 75 percent or lower. That's what right. makes sense. Yeah, okay. and that way there there's a little bit of a buffer in case something goes wrong for the next year or two, and you don't have to worry about the dividend being cut. Yes. Yeah. And um, you mentioned cash flow in the beginning. The first. The, one of the first things you look at is the cash flow. And this is so important because companies cannot fake the dividend. They have to have that cash to pay the shareholders. You might be able right. to pull it off for a year or maybe a quarter if you're going to borrow someplace from someplace else. But then the payout ratio is going to be really crazy. It's going to be too high, but you can't fake it. You have to pay, have the cash to pay the shareholders. So right. And, and, and speaking of faking it, it uh, you know, that's something managements do with earnings all the time. Uh, there's a way that they can manipulate earnings. They can, you know, pull sales forward from, uh, you know, from January 2nd to December 31st and book it December 31st. And so then that trickles down the financial statement and, and raises earnings. But if they aren't getting paid, if that invoice isn't getting paid until January, then it doesn't count for cash flow for the prior year. So cash flow is a lot harder to manipulate and, and fake the way earnings are. Yeah, and, and along the same lines, share buybacks. They can introduce share buybacks and that increases the earnings. Well, you haven't really made more money. You've just manipulated the amount of shares and now the earnings look good. Yeah. Exactly, and, that, and that's just one of the reasons I'm not a fan of buybacks. I know they're they're really popular right now and, and even Warren Buffett likes them, uh, but there, there are so many reasons I, I would prefer that if the management has the extra cash lying around that they pay dividends rather than buy back shares. And, and that's just one of the reasons. Yeah. And so, uh, Mark, I, I know you've got a, a chapter on this in your book. Um, why do companies raise their dividend? Uh, no, I, I kind of know the answer, but I just, I want to hear from you. Why not just keep the dividend within the company to grow the business? Well, and, and many companies uh, do. They, they do keep the cash to grow the business. But at a certain point, uh, when the business has gotten to a certain uh, maturity or, or it's generating so much cash that they can still fund growth with their cash flow, there's still extra cash left over. So there's only a few things they can do with it. They can buy back stock, they can save it for a rainy day, or they can start distributing it back to shareholders. And yeah, you know, a, a management team that has shareholders' best interests in mind um, will start to distribute the cash back to shareholders as a dividend um, because it's a it's a way of rewarding shareholders, especially long term shareholders, which they which they want. Um, and it also, especially for the companies that are raising that dividend every year, it it signals to Wall Street that there is confidence in the business and confidence in its cash flow going forward. Because if you've raised the dividend, especially every year for let's say 10 years, uh, and then you you suddenly stop raising the dividend, you're sending a, a strong message that something has changed here. Um, 
you know, and, and, and management can make up every excuse in the book, but it is very clear that something has changed. So by paying that dividend every year, by raising that dividend every year, that is a very strong sign of confidence to your investors and to Wall Street that cash flow is growing, that it's there, it's going to be sufficient to pay the dividend. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's another reason that they do it is, is to kind of, you know, flex that muscle a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to what you said, it's a dividend increase is, is a good sign. It means that the company, the, there's responsible management, they've crunched the numbers, and they know that they can pay this increased dividend for many, 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 many years. And the reverse is true. Like you said, if there's a dividend reduction or a dividend cut, to me, that's a red flag. Like something's going on here. Yeah, They're very much. And especially, and, and the longer you have that track record, I mean, you're mentioning, you know, Johnson and Johnson and Coca-Cola, 60 years, you know, imagine what happens if after 60 years of dividend raises, they just suddenly leave it flat this year. I mean, that would, you know, th that would make headlines. You'd have investors running for the exits. Uh, you know, the CEO is probably gonna have to update his LinkedIn profile to, you know, start looking for jobs. It's, it, uh, that would be a very, very big signal. So the longer that track record is, the more important it becomes. And, and, the, and I think the, the more that management will do to ensure that they can keep that track record alive, even, you know, even in, we saw it even during the, the global financial crisis uh, and, and during the pandemic, there were companies with those long track records where if they had to, you know, maybe they only budged the dividend by half a penny per share or a penny, you know, a very small amount, but they did it to keep that track record going when they've, when they've had a, a, an established one for, you know, 20, 25 years. They don't want to lose that. That's right. Uh, any increase is a good increase. So even if it's small, I'm happy to take that increase. Mm. Now, if we look back at March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, we saw Boeing, General Motors, and Disney cut the dividend to zero, like just eliminate it completely. How could somebody, as an investor, how could they have protected themselves from you know, investing into these kinds of companies? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I, I don't you know, recall what the, their payout ratios were, if there are any signals heading into the pandemic. But obviously, the, the pandemic was a, you know, once in a, hopefully century uh, kind of situation where it wasn't just a, a recession or a nasty recession. I mean, this was the economy shut down. So I don't know if there was, if, if there were signals in those particular companies or not. Uh, I, I think something like that would be very, very difficult to predict for the most part. If, you know, if, if you're looking at a company and the payout ratios are a little bit high, that may be a signal that kind of no matter what's down the road, if there's a problem, if, if the economy stumbles, the company stumbles, then they may have a, an issue paying the dividend. But, um, you know, with, with, with a situation where the entire economy just shut down, I think that might have been a little bit difficult to predict for a lot of companies. Yeah. And, and especially I, with the speed that it shut down. I mean, you know, it, it was almost instant. That's right. It was so fast. And like you said, hopefully once in a century, like this, we'll, we'll never see this again. Um, now, there's some good news. There's some chatter that Disney may reinstate the dividend sooner than later. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens there. Um, when it comes to General Motors, um, for myself personally, I, I usually I stay away from cyclical stocks, right? So when there is a recession, people are not going to go out and buy new cars. Mm -hmm. So I'm always worried about when the next recession is going to hit and how long it's going to be. So I just stay away from it personally, right? I know that there's other people that will continue to invest, uh, but I'll just kind of stay back uh, when it comes to those kinds of stocks. So what are some of the mistakes that you see investors making, especially those that are just starting out? Sure. So uh, chasing yield, you know, just trying to find the stocks with the highest yields. Uh, you know, very often, if a stock is a very high yield, you know, double digits, there is a reason for it because either the stock's been beaten down, uh, or you're being paid, you're you're being compensated to take on much higher risk. And now, just because something is higher risk doesn't mean it's automatically going down, but you should be aware that it's higher risk. You know, Wall Street doesn't doesn't just give away money. So if your average blue chip company is paying a, a three and a half percent yield, let's say, 
and you're looking at a stock that's paying a nine, ten percent yield, you know, you should you should be very clear that you're taking on significant risk, or or at least a you know more risk than than your typical uh, dividend stock. Um, that being said, you know, you, there are certain sectors that do pay higher yields, you know, REITs pay higher yields, business development companies pay higher yields, MLPs pay higher yields than a, a typical blue chip company. Uh, so you, so you, can, you don't have to take on that much risk and, and get some higher yields if you're, if you're kind of in the more conservative areas of those sectors. Uh, but do, I, I guess the basic lesson would be the higher y- the yield, chances are the higher the risk and, and you should be very aware of that. And you, you don't wanna load up on these very high yield companies. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with sprinkling a few in your portfolio as part of a diversified portfolio, but you don't want to be, you know, plowing your cash into a bunch of 10% yielders because that's a, a recipe for disaster the next time the market turns down. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We refer to those as sort of dividend in danger. There's a highly likelihood that the dividend's going to get cut when the yield is 12, 15, 20%, yeah. uh, which is just crazy. Um, I'll share with you a quick story with my personal story of the Washington Mutual. So prior to the 2008, 2009 uh, financial crisis, uh, the yield, I believe, was at around, I'm going to say 10%, 11%, which is so high for a bank. And I disregarded any rules and looking at the payout ratio whatsoever, and I got greedy, right? And I was like, you know what? Why should I make 2 3% yield when I can make 10 Mm-hmm. And so a uh, $5,000 investment in Washington Mutual, uh, we all know how that turned out. The yeah. company just went bankrupt, just everything got wiped out. Um, so I'm hoping the audience will learn their, you know, don't repeat the same mistakes I made and learn from that and kind of stay away from uh, high yielding stocks. I think if it's too good to be true, it probably is. It's yeah, so that's an excellent point. Just and, be careful and- there. And, and I'm sure, you know, everybody p- pays that tuition where they have that that just disastrous trade or investment. And uh, it, it's part of the learning process. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, you know, you're, we're, we're all hearing the same things on the news. Uh, last year, we saw a number of increases in the interest rate in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, I know in Canada, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the Bank of Canada decided not to raise rates uh, just this one time. Uh, inflation is running high. It was around six, seven percent. The latest numbers uh, in Canada, I think, is about five point six or five point seven percent. Still high. So there is a lot of fear uh, right mm-hmm. now, where people are thinking: Are we headed into a recession? Is unemployment going to go through the roof? Are they going to increase rates again for the remainder of this year? So are you changing the way you're investing today, or are you still investing like you have been for the last, you know? 20 years uh, now. I, no, I'm I'm not changing at all. Uh, you know, I'm I'm me personally. I'm still a long-term investor, and the way I approach my newsletter, the Oxford Income Letter, is with a long-term approach. So, I'm look. I'm not worried about what's going to happen six months from now. I'm worried about what's going to happen five years from now. And are the companies that I'm looking at? Do they have a sustainable and growing business? Uh, do they have? And and I don't I don't mean sustainable by by uh, you know an ESG. Uh, you know, a green uh, standpoint. I'm, I'm just talking about sustainable. Is, is their business, uh, you know, going to continue to thrive? Um, so that's that's what I'm I'm looking at. Can they weather a recession? Uh, be, and if they can, then then I'm not worried if we do hit one and the stock and there's another bear market and the stock drops 10, 20 uh, percent. I, I really don't worry too much about that as a long term investor. And I always tell everybody if you need any of the money that's invested in the market within three years, it should not be in, in the stock market. You know, if you can't handle a bear market uh, because, and I'm, I'm not predicting yeah, and, a bear market, but anything can happen in That's in right. The and it shouldn't, be in, it shouldn't be in mutual funds, index funds, or ETFs because they're turning around and no, putting no. into stocks. Right. Yeah. The, if, if you need cash within three years, it should be in ultra safe investments, uh, treasuries or, or CDs or, or cash in the bank. But um, yeah, so, so I'm I'm really looking that far out, and and if you can't handle the bear market, then then don't be in stock. So uh, if if I am looking at things that are are perhaps um, a little bit more recession proof or things that have been beaten up already, 
uh, since we, you know, we just had a, a nasty market in 2021. Uh, but for the most part, I, really what, what I'm trying to do is, is, is just keep diversity in my portfolio so that if I need a new oil stock or I need a new technology company or real estate, whatever, whatever holes I have in the portfolio, that's usually what I'm, I'm trying to plug in there. Okay. Are, uh, do you rebalance your portfolio at all? I know some people do it. I don't do it, but some people do it every year. Like they'll look at it and they say, oh, wait, I'm overweighted now in oil. So I'm going to sell some of those shares. Do you do any rebalancing at all annually? Or? Not with my dividend stocks. Uh, with, with, the, with my index funds, I do. But with dividend stocks, I don't because, you know, as you know, with, with a portfolio of stocks, you're going to have a certain percentage that are going to be your home runs. You're going to have a certain percentage that are going to, you know, be market performers. And then you're going to have some that are underperformers. So if I have those stocks that are outperforming, you know, I want to let those winners run and I'm going to try to hold on to them for years and years because those are the ones that you're going to look back on and they'll have become five baggers, 10 baggers, and they'll make up, you know, more than make up for the ones that underperformed. Uh, and, and even the market performers. So I generally do not want to, uh, I, I don't want to rebalance. I don't want to overthink things. You know, a, an investor is, is usually their own worst enemy. And by trying to get too cute and and doing too many things um, is, is usually the worst thing you can do. You know, there, there was a study done a number of years ago by Fidelity, and they found that the best performing accounts that they had were the ones where customers were either dead or had forgotten that they owned them. So wow. you know, in those cases, it was, it was set and forget it. I, I don't totally buy into set it and forget it, but I do kind of believe in set it and don't really mess around with it too much. You know, obviously if, if a company is, is really struggling, if that payout ratio is too high, if, if, you know, management isn't getting the job done, then you need to cut it loose. But for the most part, I really don't want to try to get too fancy, too technical with the long-term portfolio. Yeah, no, I like that. That's uh, especially as a dividend investor, right? I'm, my focus is on the dividend income. How much mm -hmm. income is my portfolio generating every single year, regardless of the stock price? Stock prices mm -hmm. are going to go up and down, right? Right. So for me to, and I agree with you, for me to sell my winners, or even the ones that are matching the market performance, every time I sell a dividend stock, I'm cutting off the supply of dividend income from those shares. Mm -hmm. And so why would I want to do that? And so again, when it comes to rebalancing, I'll just let it, you know, I'll kind of look at it like, okay, uh, now I have some more money to invest. I'm overweighted in energy. Okay. Well, I'm not going to buy any more energy stocks this time around. We'll right. get something else. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, so, and, and if yeah. the, those stocks are in a taxable account, then you have a tax event as well if you mm -hmm. take a capital gain on a big winner. Yeah. Um, and so that's not, so even if you were planning on on selling the stock and putting into something else, well, now you have a, a taxable event. And so there'll be less cash available for, uh, to, to reinvest into something else. Yeah. Now, do you know, uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer, I'll ask anyway, feel free to say no. <laughs> um, so when it comes to taxation, for U.S. dividends, I think they call them eligible dividends, or the IRS qualified has a rule dividends. for it. qualified dividends. That's probably the, the correct terminology. So, any stocks that you own outside of a four hundred one k or IRA, um, are those dividends taxed favorably? Yes, by the IRS. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you'll be taxed at a rate. Usually, usually it's the long term capital gains rate of 15%. And if you're at the very uh, highest tax brackets, it could be as much as 23.6%. Okay. Uh, so there are some advantages there, right? You're going to pay a little less tax. Uh, for our Canadian listeners, um, I've run the numbers. So if you were making 65000 a year in Canadian dividends, and if you live in British Columbia, Alberta, income tax is zero on that. So you can earn sixty five thousand a year in Canadian dividends and pay no tax. If you were making if you were making sixty five thousand a year in salary, you're looking at around fifteen thousand dollars in income taxes. So, and this is in a non registered account, so similar to what you have in the U.S. outside of four hundred one k. So there are advantages there. Um, okay, so we touched on this a little bit briefly before. What are some of the things that you think 
trip up investors, especially beginners, like people just starting to invest? What are some things that cause them to just sort of fail? So, yeah, so I mentioned, you know, chasing yield. Um, I, I think, as, as we also discussed, trying to overthink things too much and, and you know, focusing on, on finding the, you know, the perfect stock and, and uh, listening to stock tips and, and just getting too involved. Uh, you know, really the, the key to growing wealth, investing in any kind of investing, but especially with dividend companies, is time. Time is is really the most important factor. You could be a great stock picker, but if you aren't invested for long enough, you're not going to beat just a, an average stock picker who can let that money grow for years and years. So, you know, worrying about whether we have a recession, whether there's a bear market, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait till things get a little bit better. I'm going to wait till the, the economy is out of the woods, till inflation comes down. There's always a reason to wait if you you know, read the news. If you just observe the world at all, there's always a reason to be scared, to be worried about everything. And yet we know that markets go up over the long term. Uh, there'll be certainly there'll be periods of volatility and even, you know, very scary periods of volatility. But we know markets go up over the long term. So the earlier you can get that money invested. And if you're just getting started, doesn't mean you have to put all your money in at once, but get started, get that you know, that foot in the water. So you get a little bit of a taste of it. You start to get a little bit more comfortable so that the next time you want to buy a stock, it'll be a little bit easier and it'll be easier after that. And you'll, you'll begin the learning process, both kind of the emotional process of, of what it's like to put real money to work, but also the, the kind of the, the academic process of, of learning about investing and, and how companies work and, and how you should invest properly. Uh, so I, I think you know there's 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 just that always reason to be scared and 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 people uh, really hesitate because understandably nobody wants to lose money but if you have that long term approach and you say okay well I'm going to buy this stock or this group of stocks and if we go down twenty percent in the next year there's a bear market or I just pick bad stocks well I don't need this money for five years I don't need it for ten years so it's not the end of the world if my $5,000 becomes $4,000 next year because I'm not selling it. I haven't actually lost anything yet. Uh, it's just on paper. So as long as you have that mentality that you know that the market scope over the long term and you're going to pick you know, decent stocks, you're not going to do anything too crazy, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to just kind of ride out those, uh, those periods of volatility. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to add to that. The benefit with a dividend stocks is you're getting paid for owning those shares. So if the share price drops tomorrow, I'm not really worried because I'm going to get paid this quarter, right? So it kind of buffers sort of your margin of safety, right? A little bit for uh, for owning uh, those dividends. And Absolutely. the other thing I mean, I'll... If, yeah, if the go stock ahead. goes down 10% and you're getting a 5% dividend, well, your total return now is only negative 5%, not 10%. So it makes it, makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to handle. And if you're reinvesting the dividends... And I mentioned this in the book, uh, bear market's your best friend because now you're buying more shares with those dividends because the price is lower. And that generates more dividends, which buys more shares, which uh, which generates more dividends. And, and, and that's what really can get compounding uh, accelerated. Uh, so if you have this long-term approach and your stock goes down 20%, not because management's bad, not because the products are bad, but just because we hit a bear market like we did in 2022. Well, at the end of it, you own a lot more shares generating a lot more income than you did a year before. So, uh, you know, when, when there's a bear market, I mean, I, I feel for people because I know that that pain is real. But by the same token, the dividend reinvestor is should be really happy about it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you've got money to invest, right? And I, I mean, I feel the same way. When prices are low, I'm like, okay, things are on sale now. So let's pick and choose and mm -hmm. we can get a much higher uh, yield. Uh, so to share with you and the audience, um, I bought TC Energy, this is years ago, back in 2000. So 23 years of owning uh, this dividend stock. Uh, my initial investment wasn't much because I was, didn't have a lot of money back then. Uh, $2,479. So that was the initial investment. Since then, that one stock has returned over $8,000 in dividends. Wow. So it's just 
I've made my money, right? So if the stock yeah. drops the ten dollars tomorrow, I'm not really worried. Um, so it, it, I'm just adding to what you said about time. The more time you have that you can stay invested, the better off you're going to be, and you're letting compounding work. And we talked about what trips up new investors, and one of the things is frequent trading. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly buying and selling, buying and selling, you're never letting giving enough time to get the dividends and to start reinvesting them. So yeah, hold on to it, be patient. And that's the one yeah. thing you need. Um, so the other and, question and, for you. Book, you know, just, just one last thing about, uh, about time, you know, in, in the book, I, I show some uh, tables and, you know, when you read, especially if you're reinvesting the dividends, the numbers really start to get ridiculous as the years go by, you know, as far as the growth. So, you know, years one through five, I mean, your money's growing and it's, it's nice. Um, but it's not going to, you know, make your eyes pop. But once you start getting 20 years, 30 years out, you know, at, at 20 years, you know, you could be at, you know, 10x your original investment. At, at 30 years, it could be multiples of that. It, it, the numbers can get really, really big and, and it's very surprising. I, I think a lot of people are shocked at how big the numbers can get after, I mean, you just gave the example of 23 years. So after 20, 30 years and, you know, what I would say to people, you know, so, some people say, well, I don't have 30 years to invest, especially to reinvest. And, and certainly not everybody has that, but everybody knows somebody that does. So, uh, you know, I, I showed my, my 10 year old, then 10 year old son, uh, the strategy, cause I, I was writing the book and he was curious and, you know, his, his eyes kind of got wide. He said, so you mean when I'm you know, 20 or 30, I, I could have, you know, this much money if I, if I invest, you know, that much money. And I said, well, you know, no guarantees, but, but yeah, historically speaking, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, now he's, he's 21 and he, you know, he's, he's doing pretty well for a 21 year old because he started investing when he was 10 and that's only 11 years. So perhaps in another 10 years, maybe he'll be ready to buy a house and he should be in, in pretty good shape because he'll have been growing his money for 20 years. So, you know, there's always somebody that you know that does have that really long time horizon. So share the information with, with as many people as you can because, you know, imagine uh, sharing that information with a, an 18 year old kid. And by the time they're 50, uh, which most 18 year olds can't imagine ever being 50, but it does happen. Um, their whole life could be completely different if they've been investing for three decades. Yeah. Mark, that's an incredible story. I was so touched when you just mentioned that because I have a similar story, right? So I have a, an online uh, investing course. I teach people how to invest. And I tell people it's so simple that a nine-year-old could do this. And I had both of my kids start when they were nine. So oh, my okay. son and the daughter started when they were nine. My son's 20, so they're close in age. And so he's been investing since he was nine years old in right. dividend stocks. And once a year, we still get together. We review everything. We look at how many dividends are coming in. And you are absolutely right. Because I have a hard time convincing people. When I talk about dividends, people are like, well, 25 cents a share. What am I going to do with 25 cents? And right. then you got to own the shares for a year just to get the 25 cents <laughs> or, you know, or a dollar five or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of money. So when you start off in the beginning, exactly what you said, it's just small. It's just small amounts of dividends here and there, here and there. But... I'm going to encourage everyone to go check out your book. We're going to talk about the book in a second here. If you can see it like in a chart or in a graph over time, and you know, I've been doing this for 23 years, so I know, wow, it compounds. And um, I had a podcast guest, the interview will be coming out next month, uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, he's, uh, early, I'm going to say late 40s. He's, he's earning 68000 a year in dividend income. That's incredible. Yeah. Because he started young, right? So it just, it does, it will snowball, but Absolutely. it's going to take time. And, and, you know, and if you start young enough, I mean, obviously it depends on how much you invest and, and your lifestyle. But if you start young enough, you know, I think there's a very real possibility that by the time you retire, and, and, and I'm not talking about kind of the fire movement where you're going to retire at, at 40, but, uh, you know, if, if you retire, let's say in your 50s, uh, that you may have enough income to never have to touch the principal, which is, you know, really kind of the dream for, I think, most people is to, you know, never have to uh, bring down that, that capital level and just live off your, your passive income. So, uh, you know, for, for 
everyone who can, you know, invest early uh, and, and, you know, and invest, invest hard, you know, invest rigorously, put money away as much as you can, because uh, it, it does add up and it, it doesn't feel like it each month, each year, but you'll look back. And, and as somebody who now has several decades of experience uh, and, and, and never imagining that I would be this age, uh, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's amazing. Uh, what scares me is, you know, if I had to sell my shares in retirement, because mm. if I'm relying on that, if I'm yeah. relying on the capital gains to cover my expenses when I'm 65 and I don't mm. have any other sources of income, that's a scary concept to me because yeah. I'm going to sound paranoid here, but you know, when I turn 65, what if we're in a we're in a deep recession that's going to last? two, three years. It could happen. And yep. now, now I have to sell my stocks when we're in a deep recession that's going to go on for that long. That's really going to hurt my future dividend income, right? Or if we're talking about stocks that don't pay dividends, now you're really stuck because you've sold off your shares. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's a great point. Uh, you know, if you, if you're going to have to sell stock uh, in order to, to pay expenses, well, now you're really at the mercy of the stock market. Whereas if you're living off the dividends, then you're not. I mean, and, and, and if something negative happens where one of your companies stops paying the dividend, well, then you can, you can sell those shares and put it into something else uh, that does pay the dividend and, and just kind of get the machine started again. But you're not as much at the mercy of, well, is the market up 20% this year, or down 30%? And I have to think about timing exactly right to, cause I don't want to give up these gains. And, and, you know, nobody wants to be in that situation where you have to have to worry about that. You know, you want, you want to have more control. You want to be able to control it yourself. And, and if you're earning that passive income, then it's, it's much more in your control. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, people will ask me, well, how do you have any confidence? Like nobody can predict what's going to happen next week, next month, or next year. We don't know what's going to happen in the market. And, and what I tell them is, look, I've been doing this for 23 years. So I've lived through the tech bubble, lived through 9-11, which was, they shut down the stock market. The New York Stock Exchange was closed. Mm -hmm. uh, 2008, 2009, financial crisis, and now with COVID. But every single year, and I tell this to my audience all the time, for the last 23 years, my dividend income has gone up every single year. Yeah, The value of the portfolio goes up and down, but the dividend income has gone up. So yeah. if it's done that for the last two decades, I expect, I have some confidence that it'll continue over the next two decades. Yeah, and, and you know, you bring up another excellent point about just looking back at the last 23 years with uh, the dot-com crash, 9-11, the global financial crisis and COVID. I mean, within a, a relatively short period of just over two decades, those are, you know, three to four, you know, very serious uh, global events where, you know, you would have, you might not have been considered crazy to think the world is ending. And yet, what did we see? We saw markets rebound. We saw, you know, 9-11 happened, obviously, uh, in late 2001. And by uh, 2003, the market was already in a bull market. Uh, we saw the COVID crash, which immediately bounced. Uh, so, you know, the, the market does tend to shake these things off that just seem like, they'll never be able to recover from anything this horrific. And yet that's what they do. I mean, they've been doing that for a century. You know, look back at, you know, we had the Great Depression and World War II and the Kennedy assassination. I mean, there's always something, unfortunately, there's always something awful out there that really affects people, that affects the markets. And yet we know that over the long term, the markets go up. So Again, you know, don't don't be so scared of of the events that are happening in the world uh, to dissuade you from investing in the market. Because uh, you know, if, if I think if markets ever stop going up over the long term, we probably have bigger problems in the world than the market. That's right. Yeah, there's more things to worry about than your yeah. dividend income. Uh, but just to add to what you said, Mark, uh, just look at what we talked about in the beginning of this interview. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, 61 years of increasing dividends. Coca-Cola, 62 years. Procter & Gamble, 66 years. Think about how many recessions and market mm -hmm. crashes we've had in the last 60 years. But companies like these have continued to grow the dividend and consecutively, 
not just a couple of years consecutively. Yeah. So that's extremely powerful. Uh, so Mark, you talked about, you know, you started, uh, was it 21, 22, you, you had started your job and then you were putting money away in mutual funds and you got introduced to dividends when 25. Um, I mean, well, introduce, I mean, I, I think I was always aware of them once I started investing in stocks, but not really, I don't think I really started appreciating them. I actually, um, I had like five shares of AT&T from when I was a kid and I would get, I mean, literally like a dollar 25 check in the mail, nice. you know, once a quarter or something and, and really never thought much about it. But, um, it was probably my, my late 20s where i really started to think about investing in stocks for the long term i was i was as i was learning you know i had the mutual funds for the long term but for stocks i was trying to be more of a trader i thought that was exciting and and you know that that's kind of what how i thought i, I would make a whole bunch of money um but once i i kind of really understood about dividends and particularly these dividend growth companies uh yeah that's when i, I started to shift my focus a bit. Uh, it, it was a gradual process. It wasn't. It wasn't like the light bulb went off and I, and I just started plowing all my money into it. It, it was really once I started, uh, especially writing about dividends. Um, that's really when when I kind of made that that hard shift. So actually, in my thirties, when I started writing about dividends, is is when I really understood their their power. Okay, so, so it took me a while. Yeah. And it's, it's a process, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to learn all this stuff overnight. And it was the same with me. I kind of hanged on to my mutual funds. I was like, if this dividend thing doesn't work out, I have to hang on to these mutual funds. So for me, it was a three and a half, four year process where I sort of slowly started getting rid of the mutual funds and then uh, putting money into stocks. So, you know, like you said, kind of late twenties, maybe early thirties, then you started getting into it and you had a lot more knowledge. And now add to that, your years of experience, all right? And you write the letter, the Oxford, uh, what is the, what's the name of the new the Oxford letter? Income Letter. Oxford Income Letter. We're gonna talk about your book in just a minute here. So you've got a book called Get Rich With Dividends. So you've got all this wealth of knowledge and information over the years. If you could go back in time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you tell yourself? Oh, get started investing in dividend growth companies immediately. And, and don't worry so much about the mutual funds. Uh, again, I, I think I think there's a place for them in a diversified portfolio uh, to kind of smooth out some of the edges. But for sure, I'd be investing in dividend growth companies and and just getting that compounding started as, as fast as possible um, because and, and as early as possible, because that's, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate that I started investing at 22 years old. But if I had been investing the right way at 22 years old. Uh, you know, the the amount of, of passive income that would still be reinvested in dividends today, because I'm still reinvesting all my dividends, but it, it would be a, a significantly higher number for sure. Yeah, I feel the same way. I wish I started 15 years earlier yeah. when I finally figured this stuff out on how to do but, that. But like you said, it, it's a process. I mean, everybody everybody goes through it. Everybody has kind of their own investing journey. They make mistakes. It costs them money. They They learn something they wish they knew earlier. And I think what you and I are trying to do is is shorten that that timeline for everybody, but but everybody does go through it. So for anybody out there who's kicking themselves about something that they did wrong or that they wish they had learned this earlier, just just know that everybody goes through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Mark, your uh, the newsletter does that cover dividend stocks specifically, yeah. or are you covering other things as well in there? Uh, there, we, we also do cover some bonds, but it's, it's really focused on dividend growth companies. And it was actually kind of an offshoot from Get Rich With Dividends. Um, so in the book, uh, I discuss a, a, a proprietary system called the 10, 11, 12 system. And then I use that in the Oxford Income Letter to actually uh, make the stock recommendations. Okay, great. So what made you write the book? Why write a book called Get Rich With Dividends? Because once I, I really understood the power of these dividend growth companies and seeing that that not only can they generate a tremendous amount of wealth, but that they can do it conservatively, that it can help people sleep better at night, uh, that they don't have to go try to find the next Tesla or Facebook or, or high sure, growth sure. company, that they can do this in a, in a really conservative way, uh, in, in a way that's worked for decades, that... It, 
you know, it was really, it was really, really important. I mean, we were, we had just come out of the global financial crisis and there were a lot of people that had some, you know, that were still very wounded from that, uh, both, both financially and, and emotionally. Uh, that, that, you know, the global financial crisis really did a number on a lot of people and, and really shook their confidence in the markets and in, in themselves. And so I wanted to, to show people that this is a, a way of investing that has worked for decades through all these other various calamities and that you could do it in a way that you would be able to sleep at night um, and, and, and that it's important, especially coming out of the global financial crisis where you know, prices were a little bit lower than they had been in 2006, 2007. So this was a, this was a really good opportunity if you hadn't started investing uh, to get it started now when prices are a little bit lower, or if you were investing but still a little bit gun shy to uh, to go ahead and, and get started investing uh, or to you know start investing more uh, and, and and really get that compounding accelerated because it was it was a good time for that to happen. Yeah, and and this approach, uh, what we're talking about here today, does not require you to spend five six hours a day watching stock symbols all day exactly. long. Right, we're not doing that. Yeah, as, as I said, it's it's not quite set it and forget it, but it's you know you don't have to watch CNBC and read the Wall Street Journal and check your stock prices every day. You know, I, what I recommend is not even every quarter necessarily. Uh, you know, you want to make sure your dividends getting paid, but you know, once or twice a year, take a look at the financial reports, make sure cash flow is growing, make sure the payout ratio is sustainable. If, uh, I'm sorry, is low enough. If the cash flow is not growing, then dig a little bit deeper, understand why. If, is that going to be a short-term issue? Is that going to be a longer-term issue? But, you, you know, like you're saying, it, it's not something that should be consuming you daily. Now, for some people love it and that, that's fine. Uh, and, and you can you can do that and, and spend your time researching and, and finding new stocks, but for a lot of people, you know they just they just want their money to make money for them. So it, it's really a, a way that you can kind of go about your life and and just check in every once once in a while and, and make sure everything is on track. Which for the most part it should be. If you have these companies that have been raising their dividends for all these years in a row, for the most part they continue to do so. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that. Take everything with a grain of salt when it comes to the media and the news. The news is negative every single day. You watch enough news, you think everything's just the worst uh, and the markets are just going to implode. Um, because what happens is when you're taking in too much information from all over the place, Twitter, whatever, social media, all this stuff, it's going to confuse you and you don't want to make any knee-jerk reactions. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's an expression you may have heard in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, you know, they're, they're in the business of selling bad news. And then and I actually heard a new uh, term, maybe it's been around for a while, but it's new to me. Um, when you're on your phone and you're, you know, going through Facebook and Twitter and all this terrible news called doom scrolling. Mm. Uh, and and, and once, kind of once I heard that term, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that is kind of what I'm doing. And, and I'm making a conscious effort not to do that anymore. So, uh, I'm really trying hard not to just read all these negative news stories. Obviously, if there's if, it, if it's important to the market, if it's important to a particular stock, I'm going to pay attention. But for the most part, I am trying to shut out this this overall negative news that that usually is not that important. You know, uh, again, it's, it's, sometimes there is something you need to pay attention to, but most of the times it's not. So I'm, I'm really trying to block that stuff out so that um, e even someone like me who is very patient, very content to let my stocks uh, go for years and years, uh, I still get caught up in that news cycle. So I'm trying really hard not to anymore. Yeah, it's just, it, it, it's a lot of noise. So you have to be careful of what, you got to filter through that, of what you put in into your mind. Um, and and the, one other thing is don't panic, right? We talked about before, when prices are coming down, that's a great opportunity to buy mm -hmm. some good stocks, high quality stocks that are, the yield is going to be higher. But when people panic is this is when they start to sell. Sure. And they just panic. And that's the worst time to sell is now you've solidified your losses. Mm -hmm. When things are and going down and you don't sell, it's just a paper loss. Your dividends are still coming in and the market's going to come back up again. Absolutely. And, and even if you don't have the conviction to, to put more money to work in a bear market, which, which you know, that it, it's usually it's the right hard. thing to do, but it, it is tough to do emotionally. It's very hard to do it. Yeah. So even if you can't 
get yourself to pull that trigger, but you're reinvesting the dividends. Know that just by doing that, you know, you're like I said earlier, you're buying more shares, which is generating more income, and and it, it's really going to help grow your wealth over the long term faster than if that didn't happen. So, um, you know, just just know that you're just by staying the course, you're doing yourself a really big favor in a bear market. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, Mark, when is your? Um, I understand you have a new version coming out of the book, Get Rich with uh, Dividends. Uh, That's right. Can yeah, you the- let everybody know when it's coming out. Sure. So the third edition is coming out April 4th and uh, it's available on Amazon now f- uh, to pre-order. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. The, uh, the second edition was in 2015. So it's, it's been a while uh, since, since the last edition. So there's a lot of new information, um, especially what I was, the reason I, I agreed to do the third edition is be- because, you know, this was not a great time period for value stocks, which are often what dividend stocks are, not always, but very often they are value stocks. And so, you know, from that period, from uh, roughly, you know, 2014 to 2020, really, was not a great time for value stocks. Growth significantly outperformed value. So I really wanted to kind of confirm the thesis thesis and say, okay, how did these dividend growers perform um, you know, factoring in this this period of underperformance for value stocks, uh, you know, looking at it from the long term, and and the thesis was very much confirmed that they st- still did very very well. Uh, in fact, from 2014 to 2022, uh, now granted, after the pandemic, value stocks uh, outperformed growth, so there was a little period of outperformance for value, but uh, they they basically performed the same as uh, as the S and P 500, but they did so with much less risk, and you basically got paid more for the risk that you were taking. So, uh, so it's it was a conservative strategy that worked. You basically made the same amount as the overall market with less risk. So again, being able to sleep better at night. So, and, and again, this was in a period that mostly where it underperformed. Um, right now, we're in a period where value is outperforming, and so. If that continues, and these these cycles do tend to last for for multiple years, it's it's not usually not the kind of thing where value outperforms for three months and then growth for six months and, and flips back and forth. Uh, so so I think right now is a really good time to invest in dividend stocks because many of them are value stocks, and we should get some outperformance out of them for the next few years. Yeah, that's all. That's good news. Good news for dividend investors like myself and and a lot of our audience as well. So that's great. Um, everybody should check out the book, uh, Get Rich with a Dividends. It's, uh, it, this should be, Mark, this should be required reading for everybody in high school. And I say the same thing about my course. Everybody in high school should get this because this is how you're going to fund the rest of your mm-hmm. life. Exactly. And, and I, you know, so many people who've read the book have, have said to me and, and some of the reviews on Amazon say exactly that, that, you know, this should be taught in high school. I wish I had known this when I was 18. I'm getting the book for my kids or grandkids because they need to know this. And, you know, I know they're not going to learn this at school. Uh, You know, whether it's my book, your course or something, they do need to teach more financial literacy in, in especially high school, but you can even start in middle school and, and really get kids uh, to just have an understanding of money and how it works and how the compounding process works, both for growing wealth and also staying out of trouble with debt. It's, it's really important. It, it's, a, it's a life skill that, they, that most schools don't teach and it's a shame. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, so Mark, where can people get in touch with you if they wanna shoot you an email or something? Do you have a website, Twitter presence, any of those things? Sure, all those things. So um, our free e-letter is wealthyretirement.com. Uh, so you can go over there. Uh, for more information on the book, if, if you, like I said, you can go to Amazon or getrichwithdividends.com. And then I'm also on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is at stocks, the letter N, like Nancy, stocks N boxing. So stocks and boxing. I love it. We're going to put the links down below in the description uh, of this uh, interview so people can uh, check that out. One last question. Mm-hmm. I love the boxing thing. Can you tell our audience why you have the word boxing in your Twitter handle? Sure. So I have a very bizarre side hustle. Uh, I'm a ring announcer for boxing and mixed martial arts, and I've been doing it for 17 years now. Um, 
you know, done HBO, Showtime, ESPN, uh, actually had a fight last night. So I, I drove back early this morning uh, to be able to do the podcast. Uh, so yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's just a really fun thing that I do on uh, some nights and weekends. And um, my Twitter, usually I'm talking about stocks. There's occasionally a boxing comment here, but it's usually about stocks. Uh, that's incredible. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I think that would be another totally different episode that we could do just on the sport of boxing and mixed martial arts. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I think we could have talked for another hour easily. Uh, my favorite topic, dividend stocks. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your information, your experience, and, and all of that. I really appreciate it, Mark. Sure. Thanks for inviting me. This was a lot of fun.